still. What? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Welcome to this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast, home of the mysterious and the macabre, where we sit in the basement every week challenging conventional thought. Today we plan to dive into something that has been a dark and often shameful cloud over humanity and the medical field since its beginning, mental health practices. The subject within this that we will be exploring today is the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum of Weston, West Virginia. It is a physically and figuratively looming example of failure in the mental health systems across the United States during a huge span of time. To its credit, mental health has been a tough one to figure out. Before asylums, people who were mentally ill were often thrown into prisons, chained to walls with the criminals, even if they were completely nonviolent. Once it was realized that this was an extremely bad idea, asylums were developed and the experimental nature of how to handle our mentally ill continued in a different way. They often became unwilling guinea pigs, and it seems that this treatment of the patients became so common that it became accepted in society because they so desperately wanted a way to relieve themselves from having to look at these people on the streets or to relieve themselves of the responsibility of them. They kind of turned a blind eye to the horrific things that were going on and how treatment and research of mental illness got so out of hand. But we're not here to talk about mental health in general. We, truthfully, could do a whole other podcast on that. Upon its opening in 1863, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum had good intentions, I think. They promised hope for dignity and peace for people who had long been treated inhumanely by their peers in society and even by their families. The generally unaccepted and disenfranchised. During a time when people with mental health problems were not exactly treated fairly, it was thought that they were better kept a secret. You would usually find them hidden away in the attics of family homes, locked up in a room somewhere, tucked away from existence, out of sight, out of mind. There was no medication available for things like this, and many times they were treated as major inconveniences. Beyond this, the mentally ill were also often abandoned by their loved ones who didn't have time or the means to care for them. They were left to wander the streets, homeless and forgotten, and looked down upon by most who passed them by in the busy hustle of their everyday lives. There really was no standard of care for a person with serious mental health issues aside from whatever miracle concoction the street truck pharmacy was doling out, which was never a good idea. I have to start off by telling you that I found this picture on the internet from one of the Trans Allegheny websites. It is a picture of a medication vial from this asylum, and guess what the medication was? What? It was one gram of iron with a little dab of arsenic and strychnine. That's fair. How times have changed. (laughs) So we'll put the picture on our website also so you guys can see. Okay. For the listeners, in case you want to see it. They used arsenic for um, facial treatments as well. Gave your skin a nice glow. Very healthy. The opening of an asylum would offer relief for all, the patient, the families, and society. This place would give them a home and some psychiatric assistance. The end goal was to possibly humanize them so that they may be able to return to society new and reformed human being. With the rising problem of mental health during the 1800s, this became a very popular idea. The thought of people being able to rid their homes of this embarrassing inconvenience and also rid the streets of depraved individuals who would incite feelings of sorrow and despair or just pure annoyance all over the cities would be even better hidden away in another place, out of the way. It also seemed like a really modern and improved medical concept in a world of mental illness, moving away from simply hiding these unfortunate people to avoid embarrassment for their families and toward an actual curative and progressive facility. Here they can sometimes be rehabbed and sent back out into society to live their lives after they've learned how. may have also significantly cut down on the number of exorcisms performed. Absolutely. Perhaps. And we have to keep in mind, too, that there was probably a lot more of this scene. Life was a lot harder back then than it is now. They had no options. 
you have to give the families a break also. They already had a lot going on. It was hard enough to live and feed themselves and survive in the world. So having someone in your family with a mental health issue, they didn't have someone who could be with them or provide one-on-one care or any of those things. So it probably just added a lot of stress to the family, and this is probably why these things happened. Yeah, but also the standards for what they considered mentally ill and the criteria that they had for being placed in one of these facilities was a lot different. So (laughs) I'm going to take away some of that credit and we'll talk about that later. I will agree. Trans Allegheny was built according to the Kirkbride model with state of the art specifications and was described as magnificent and sustainable. The Kirkbride plan was developed by a psychiatrist from Philadelphia by the name of Thomas Story Kirkbride with an emphasis on architecture that was designed to have curative and therapeutic effects on patients. These facilities had long, staggered wings and provided lots of light and fresh air. The more I read about the different buildings from this time period, this seems to have been a pretty popular floor plan for hospitals and asylums. It had a working farm, indoor plumbing, a gas well, a cemetery, and a dairy. Stonemasons had been brought from Germany and Ireland to help with the design and gorgeous architecture. Blue sandstone was quarried from Mount Clare, and stone was brought in from the riverbanks of the town of Weston. So this sounds like a good plan, having everything mostly self-sustaining and not having to worry about getting supplies from the town or costing the town more money. It sounded like they had a good start to to the idea of Trans-Allegheny. And not to mention the therapeutic benefits of having a sustainable farm that would be work and purpose for yeah. some of the patients there. Kind of providing tasks and goals. And indoor plumbing. Ooh. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning of the Trans-Allegheny story. Construction began on the buildings in 1858 but it was put on hold due to the outbreak of the United States Civil War. In 1861, Virginia seceded from the Union, and the separate restored government of Virginia was born in Weston. Later that same year, Union soldiers marched to Weston. They woke up a bank teller in the dead of night and removed $27,000 from the Exchange Bank of Virginia at gunpoint. This money was meant to resume construction on the unfinished hospital. The Union used the money as startup cash for a new government, which would eventually become the state of West Virginia in 1863. Sounds like a pretty governmenty thing to do. During this time, the partially built asylum and associated grounds became Camp Tyler to the Union Army. It provided barracks and a military post. Control of the post flipped from Union to Confederate and back again several times, and this invasion stripped the facility bare of all food and clothing that was intended for the initial group of patients. After the war, a lawsuit ensued between Virginia and the new state of West Virginia, and the money was eventually returned to the hospital, but then they had to use much of that for repairs and new food and clothing for the initial patients that were taken. Construction then resumed in 1863, and the very first patients were admitted in 1864. The bare minimum had been accomplished at the asylum, but they resumed work clear until 1881, until it was a finished product. This was just after West Virginia had achieved statehood and right before the end of the Civil War. It ended up being right around 242 square feet with four floors, and it was 1,296 feet long. It had 921 windows and 906 doors. And in the middle, there was a 200-foot clock tower that is described as stretching from the center like a hand reaching to God. It ended up being the largest hand-cut stone building in all of America, the second largest in the world, and the pride and joy of West Virginia. You can go to their website online and find lots and lots of photos of this place. It really was beautiful. Architecture was a lot different back then. They took a lot more time to make things beautiful, and there was a lot of emphasis on detail, and it's kind of a Gothic Revival-style building. It's definitely worth a Google. Absolutely worth a Google. The open and bright design was centered around making the patients feel as though they were at home and not in an institution, so they could be relaxed and feel as though they were being well cared for. If you visited today, you could see the carvings of faces into the side of the building intended to ward off evil spirits. It was designed as a sanctuary with all the best intentions, but that is not how it ended up. 
The building was designed to house 250 souls, and by the time of its closing in 1994, it housed 10 times that at 2,500. Let me repeat that. 2,500 people in a building made to house 250. Its two and a half foot thick walls were enough to muffle even the most tortured screams and keep the darkest secrets hidden away. This intended holistic approach to mental illness that was envisioned for the asylum did not last very long. So we'll get into the horrifying history of the asylum. Not even history. As of today, they still have issues with being horrified in a different way. There's a lot of spirits that are said to walk the halls of Trans Allegheny. So we'll probably get into that later. We didn't find a lot in our research as far as the ghostly aspect of the asylum, but the actual proven physical history is plenty scary enough. When they opened their doors, people immediately began to filter in, and only seven years after opening, they had already more than doubled their capacity and didn't seem to be turning anyone away. Keep in mind, though, that in this time period, people could be committed for literally anything, especially women because they were rigidly expected to live by specific standards and expectations. It was not uncommon for women to be committed for things such as PMS and moodiness. A man could commit his wife for any reason at all. Say he was tired of her behavior, he'd send her to the asylum and went on to start a new relationship. If he never returned to get her, his wife would then become a ward of the state. These were often the women who fought because often they were not mentally ill. And with no one to speak for them, and with them being the state's responsibility, if they caused any trouble about it, they were the ones likely to be subject to experiments and behavior modification procedures. So really, sit and imagine this. You're fine, but someone wants to commit you to an asylum for whatever reason, they just can't. They just can. They'll just take you and they don't let you out. So this would be the worst thing ever. To lose your freedom for nothing and there really isn't anything you can do. The more you tell them that you're not crazy, the more they just think you're saying that because you're crazy. And I can sympathize with that feeling because when I worked in the psychiatric unit, yes, I was can. concerned <laughs> every single day that they weren't going to let me out. I'll go ahead and read you some of the more unreasonable by my standards. Listed reasons for admission for men and women that were accepted in the 1800s. Do we have a drum roll? We can do it like Letterman, like the top 10. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Business trouble. Ill treatment by husband, which I don't feel like would be their fault, right? Like if your husband's. Why is that their fault? If your husband's a jerk and you have to go to the mental institution. Well, maybe that's why. Like for your protection. He beat you because you made him. Right. Immoral life. Laziness. I yep. Going back to jail. <laughs> I'm going back. <laughs> Parents were cousins. Use of tobacco. Being bad company. <clears throat> Sam. <laughs> Political. <laughs> <laughs> I am fabulous company. Political excitement. Yep. There I go. Jealousy. <laughs> Greediness. Grief. Feebleness of intellect. Novel reading. I feel like this means reading for fun, correct? Not reading Just novels. reading novels. The reading of novels or reading as a novelty. And my favorite, imaginary female trouble. I mean, this would be a pretty extreme percentage of today's population, right? Who hasn't been pretty annoyed with the politics in America? Especially lately, both sides are a little pissed off all the time. Ever fought with your spouse or been jealous? Boom, you're a lunatic. Oh, and the imaginary female trouble? I just figured out what that probably means. When do girls make up female trouble? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to the asylum. Trans Allegheny, here we come. Although these are listed as reasons for admission, I'm hoping that these are more like reasons that led to the extreme mental illness. But a lot of sources say that this is just not so. They weren't putting up with any outlandish crap in society at that point, were they? Don't step out of line. Think of all the weirdness in the world today. What about the clown pandemic? Oh, oh, speaking of the weird people today, did you hear about the The TV? random TV deliveries? Yeah, yeah there's that a was town weird. and somebody is walking around with a TV on his head in a jumpsuit and dropping off broken televisions on people's porches and like, waving at their security cameras. Old TV. It's crazy. It's I mean, it's weird. kind of funny, but that'll get you into old TA. Over time, people continued to line up to bring family members and loved ones to be admitted. 
The staff in the facility were unable to keep up with this rapid influx of souls who needed them. Conditions declined very, very quickly. They were cramming sometimes four and five patients in rooms that were designed for one, and the farm and the dairy weren't producing enough to meet the demand, so patients quickly began to starve. By 1938, they were six times over capacity and patients were running wild all over the premises, mostly unsupervised by the orderlies who were completely overrun by them. So you wonder why wasn't more staff hired to help, but then you think about the time period and the depression. Yeah, they're, they experienced the depression, but I mean, it's not like they wouldn't have had people lining up to work. I would think, right? They probably didn't have the money to pay them. Yeah, maybe. Or why they took on more patients after they reached capacity also probably because of the depression, because they were getting paid to take patients. And But if you think about it, even now, a lot of the people who suffer from mental illness don't have the capacity to pay. So whether they're admitted or not doesn't mean that they're necessarily getting paid. Yeah, but things are different now. Now we do insurance. At this point, it, it was people's families just wanting to get rid of their inconvenient relatives. They were paying. Not always. So who knows if they didn't just abandon these people there and yeah, n- not pay. I would just like to think that this wasn't some form of early corporate greed. Stuffing patients into standing room only conditions just to get more money into the hospital. Some things never change. Someone was lining their pockets, is all I'm saying. Right? Mm -hmm. The population of patients in the hospital reached 2,500 unwanted souls by the 50s. And oddly, the hospital was now offering to pay people to drop off their misbehaving family members. Many of these people showed no signs of actual mental illness when they arrived. I guess I've never heard of a hospital paying for patients. Usually mental health care is pretty decent financial burden for families and patients alike. Experiments and lobotomies were being performed regularly on these people, and it seems that it was easy to get away with since people were dying by the droves and no one really seemed to raise a fuss about it. Some reported that if any patients complained about the experiments, cages, ice water baths, electroshock therapy, bloodletting, insulin coma therapy, or lobotomies, they were put into solitary confinement where they were chained to the wall and left for weeks or even months, and sometimes they would be fed and given water, if the staff happened to remember. The overcrowding seems to have been the worst problem here as there were not nearly enough staff to keep control over this population. A population of 2,500 men, women, both mentally ill and committed against their will, criminals, and yes, children. People could commit their children who they deemed unruly to Trans-Allegheny where they were basically thrown into general population with the rest of the patients. Patient-on-patient abuse and violence was a huge problem, and so was patient-on-patient murder. In one situation, two men shared a room with another, and they were getting annoyed with his loud snoring throughout the night. So they conspired together and ambushed him, hanging their roommate with a bedsheet in their room. When he didn't die fast enough, they brought him down and put him on the floor. They then lifted their bed and used the metal bed frame to crush his skull over and over. When the authorities asked the men why they felt compelled to murder him, it said that while one man was quiet, the other replied, the ghost did it. There was a letter to the editor that was published in a local newspaper in Weston. It referred to yet another murder that took place in Trans-Allegheny. It reads this, Some days ago, according to the Clarksburg Telegram, a patient confined in the asylum was brutally murdered by another inmate. The attendants, watchful guardians, knew nothing of the matter until the head of the poor victim was beaten to a jelly. No inquest was held, and I presume the poor creature will be reported as died in the next annual report. This sort of thing may be all right, but a number of people here do not think so, and would thank the legislator for a good committee to investigate the management of the asylum. This tells me that at least some of the townspeople obviously understood that there was a severe level of mistreatment and mismanagement going on in the facility. This letter even alludes to the townspeople's awareness of management attempts to gloss over these brutalities in their reports. We didn't even have mental health protocols yet, so I highly doubt there were any rigorous laws keeping things square here. An article was also published regarding the murder. It reads as well. On the 31st of January, 1877, Soon after the attendants having charge of ward number 8 in the hospital, 
unlocked their sleeping rooms, and before the patient mentioned in the above paragraph had fully dressed himself, another patient, who had been more expeditious in putting on his clothes, slipped in upon him before he left his room and struck him with several blows with a bed slat, from which he died. These patients occupied rooms in different parts of the ward, and, as set forth in the accompanying certificate, the one that inflicted the injury had not previously manifested homicidal proclivities. The attendants discovered the dead shortly after it was committed, and at once reported the fact to the physicians, but the patient was in a dying condition when the doctor reached him. The superintendent then made known the facts to the proper authorities, but owing to the circumstances, a formal inquest was not thought to be necessary. But at the doctor's solicitation, the prosecuting attorney and several physicians examined the remains and questioned all who knew anything relative to the case. The patient that perpetrated the act acknowledged that he did it, and in a very succinct manner entered into full revelation. He said that if he had not killed him, the deceased would have murdered him, all of which, of course, was the offspring of his disordered brain. His victim was an epileptic in the lowest stages of insanity. He did not have mind enough to make any defense, nor to call for assistance, which he would have received had he done so, and there were others in the hall who would have noticed any unusual noise or commotion. Okay, so this was an article that was published about this murder. It's a little hard to understand, so basically we're going to unpack it a little bit. One patient snuck up on another bright and early in the morning, beat him with a bed slat, and killed him. The authorities were notified, but they pretty much told the doctor to handle the investigation on their own, and they would just back up whatever he said. The murderer was thought to be paranoid in thinking that he would be likely killed by this man, who was merely an epileptic, not insane, not violent, and this article is published to point out one good example of the hospital's continued mistake in placing extremely violent patients in the same areas as extremely vulnerable ones. Imagine your sweet disabled grandmother being assigned a roommate like Hannibal Lecter. Or like Sam here. It puts the lotion on the skin. In response to these publishings, the hospital released the death certificate of the deceased and it read... We, the undersigned, at the request of Dr. T.B. Camden, viewed the body of G.T. and find that he came to his death by the hands of J.M., an insane patient, by blows inflicted by him with a bed slat upon the head, fracturing the bones of the skull, and that the act was unavoidably committed on sudden impulse, and as far as we're able to ascertain, no blame can be attached to anyone, given our hands. So... No one took the blame, and it was just chalked up to one of those things. Boys will be boys. So this document was signed by all involved, and a note was added. We have omitted the full names of the two patients referred to in the certificate, and have used merely the initials for the sole reason of saving the feelings of their friends. I will be readily seen by these facts that there was no disposition to conceal anything connected with the much-regretted catastrophe. So glad they cleared that up. And just think, people died by the thousands in places like this and in situations just like this. It would have been a very scary and lonely place to be as a sane person. But for people who were mentally ill, those feelings of abandonment and neglect couldn't have helped their situation at all. This place was a total recipe for catastrophe. Obviously, there were several people being housed in each room, so the same bed would be used by three or four different patients, and they were forced to sleep in shifts. 2,500 people many of them completely insane, some of them very despondent about being placed here against their will, some of them children, some of them criminals, housed in tight, dark, unsanitary conditions with very little actual mental health assistance. Most of them scared and very distrustful of the experiment-happy and incredibly abusive orderlies and doctors, patients outnumbering the doctors and orderlies by a long shot, and everyone is very sleep-deprived. This sounds like a nightmare. The tactics that started out as focused on therapeutic and curative measures soon became strategies of simply maintaining order. The attitude completely shifted from how can we help these people live regular peaceful lives to how can we keep them contained and quiet. There were just too many to really focus on any one of them for any length of time to help develop their thoughts and skills and the more unruly patients who needed more attention, they were just put in cages. They put them in cages to keep them from getting murdery. 
I read about another murder of a woman by the name of Muriel Creamer. She was admitted on May 18, 1963. Muriel was a housewife from Charlestown, West Virginia, prior to her admission and would never again get the chance to return home. She passed away on May 25th, only a short week after her admission. She was found deceased in her room in Ward C around 9 p.m. when the psychiatric aide was doing bed checks. She had been bound to the bed earlier that day to prevent her from trying to leave it. When she was found, she'd passed away with a piece of muslin cloth around her neck. Her death was listed as homicide by strangulation with a bed sheet. Her roommate, Wanda Janes, who had been admitted only that same day for paranoid schizophrenia, admitted freely that she killed Muriel for making unwanted advances to her, when she was tied up, apparently. Wanda had been known to be violent and argumentative as a schizophrenic, and she was sent to Ward C, where it is said that the most violent and unpredictable patients were held. So the way it sounds, they placed the more mild-mannered Muriel Creamer in a room with an extremely violent, mentally ill schizophrenic woman and tied her to a bed so that she couldn't defend herself. And then they left her there with no one to watch over her. They possibly dropped the ball here. <laughs> no. The hospital was sued for wrongful death by the executor of Muriel's estate, Mr. John Creamer, and the case went to the West Virginia Supreme Court in 1969. It was found that the hospital was not at fault, and they could not have possibly known that Mrs. Janes was violent or homicidal, even though it was documented in the admission note. I'm guessing that they didn't want to lose the hospital and turn all of those patients back out onto the streets for society to deal with. Or, maybe the fact that the hospital was Weston's primary employer for the town and closing it would cause a huge financial strain on the local economy. But that's just me theorizing. Employees were also being attacked regularly. At one point, a nurse went missing, and it was unnoticed for quite a while. Once they figured out that she was gone, they did a little questioning and seemed to have done a quick sweep around the building with no luck finding her. From what I read, it seems like they just assumed that she got frustrated and overwhelmed and took off. Business went on as usual, and they just kind of didn't worry about it. Two months later, her body was discovered hidden at the bottom of a staircase that wasn't often used. Two months later. So I assume no family came looking for her, or that would have maybe alerted them to something being wrong? Apparently not, which is extremely sad. So along with the murders, there were many, many reports of suicides and rapes that probably went unreported. Also, a drug called Thorazine was developed specifically to treat psychiatric disorders, but, lo and behold, it was soon noted that increased doses would put people into a catatonic state. So, naturally, they thought, hell yeah, load them up. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with there being too many unhappy and combative people to deal with, Thorazine quickly became a widely prescribed drug that was given in high doses to make the population more controllable. Laudanum was also used in abundance. This is an opiate that was common during this time period to treat pain, but was also known to provide sedation. I want to throw in here that I've read several books in the past in which laudanum was used as a poison to murder folks too. So that was a thing. It was also used widely in drug dens. What's a drug den? Is that a legitimate question? Is that like a meth house Like a crack today? house, okay. yes. <laughs> gotcha. Here's a crazy one. Insulin shock therapy was a commonly used method for sedation as well. Insulin shock therapy. This was the most common treatment for schizophrenia and was developed by a man named Manfred Sakel, who noted that small amounts of insulin helped with opiate withdrawals. Maybe that started out to be reasonable, but after some animal testing that was done in Sakel's home kitchen, he <laughs> can be... <laughs> He concluded that severe hypoglycemia would be safely reversed, so deeper and deeper comas were permitted. This became extremely popular in the world of psychiatric medicine and was used often to keep more unruly patients in an actual hypoglycemic coma for weeks, sometimes months, with daily doses of enough insulin to drop their blood sugar to dangerously low levels and render them unconscious. So the results of these animal testings, which were concluded to be safe, I'm feeling like our definition of safe and their standards of safe were probably not similar. They may differ mildly. Nothing like a good old-fashioned diabetic coma to make a person more chill. Here's where things get even more crazy. The infamous Dr. Walter Freeman 
I've been waiting to talk about Dr. Walter Freeman. He was a traveling physician who regularly made rounds to the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum during the 40s and 50s. If you haven't heard of Dr. Freeman, he was well known for his so-called expertise in performance of frontal lobotomies. His record was sound though, right? Not so much. He performed around 3,439 lobotomies in his lifetime with a 14% fatality rate. This actually may have been pretty good given that time period. Mm, possibly. And just given the extremely psychopathic procedure being performed. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Same. So, Dr. Freeman was chosen to head up a program called the West Virginia Lobotomy Project. Sounds like a boy band. Um, <laughs> does. Which was essentially an effort to reduce the number of symptomatic patients in asylums due to overcrowding. So basically, if they can't get rid of some, they'll take away their symptoms, meaning, you know, their feelings, their personality, to make them more manageable. Anyone can manage a drooling blob of a person with no soul left in them. Let's just take away who you are and see how that goes. His tool of choice? An ice pick. So he jammed an ice pick through the eye socket and into the brain to intentionally and permanently interrupt the neural connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex. This left them completely without affect and without their personality. They would be alive, but they were often gone, unable to perform even the most basic self-care. What was thought to be a relief of unwanted symptoms was really just permanent brain damage, and they did this to thousands of people. So we moved from putting people into comas with insulin to physically altering their brains with an ice pick. But it's a good thing he was there to humanize them. In 1952, Dr. Freeman performed 228 ice pick lobotomies at this facility in a two-week period. One on a 10-year-old boy. I read somewhere that he was getting right around a whopping $25 for each of these procedures, and each one only took 5 to 10 minutes, so he was doing pretty well for the time period. So he's getting paid by the procedure. So, of course, he's trying to pack as many of these in a day as possible. 228 ice pick lobotomies in two weeks. That's crazy. That's a full day. It's a full day of work right there. Although this was a normal and accepted practice during this time in hospitals all over the United States, Trans-Allegheny became well known for being exceptionally brutal. Forced behavior modification was the top treatment priority for years and years. And this resulted in thousands of deaths here, or at the very least, drooling and permanent brain damage. Get ready. We're going to get more into this. Get ready to be wowed by this guy's talent. Dr. Freeman made these procedures a theatrical event by encouraging crowds and audiences. So he treated these patients as a circus act. He would drag an unwilling, terrified person onto the stage and shove an ice pick into their head. And it was entertainment. One thing that I can't understand about this I realized that during this time period, the medical community thought that this was best. At least that's what they say. But did they really? A huge number of people were lobotomized for really no apparent reason other than minor personality traits that some might find mildly distasteful. And you can't tell me that they didn't realize that this was making a permanent change in the personalities of these people. There are reports of children undergoing these procedures with no knowledge or explanation as to what was about to happen to them. They were led or dragged into a room by seemingly well-intentioned, nice people, or not, and then bam, nothing. The more and more that I read about people like Dr. Freeman, I think society gave way too much credit to people who claim they knew better. They literally handed them their children, sisters, brothers, people they loved and let them shove an ice pick into their brain. People traveled long distances for this. I'm going to dive a little deeper into the career of Dr. Walter Freeman. From what I understand, he was basically an extremely theatrical psychopath. Aren't they all theatrical, though? Yeah. He would drive thousands of miles to perform demonstrations in front of hundreds of people, using an unwilling patient, of course. The procedure that Dr. Freeman showcased was an improved version of another lobotomy performed by Dr. Moniz in Portugal. Moniz's procedure involved drilling two small holes in either side of the forehead and severing the connective tissue around the frontal lobes in order to reduce the strength of emotional signals produced by the brain and dull the psychiatric illness. Moniz emphasized strongly that this should always be done as a last resort and only if every other single treatment had been unsuccessful. Dr. Freeman's procedure was done recklessly, 
sometimes before any other form of psychiatric treatment had ever been attempted. He touted his procedure as a cure-all, the way to go in the psychiatric world. Freeman's transorbital lobotomy involved the hammering of a basic kitchen ice pick through the tear ducts and into the frontal lobe tissue of the brain, where he then scrambled the ice pick from side to side in order to damage the frontal lobe completely. It took around 10 minutes and was said to be very convenient because it could be done anywhere. With no assistance from a surgeon, there are no words. He was, by many accounts, extremely unprofessional. No kidding. If his profession itself doesn't just completely baffle you. Here are some things that will. He would chew gum loudly and laugh, sometimes showing off by ice picking both eyes at the same time, one with each hand. He refused to even practice sterile technique, which was common practice by then, and is said to have stated himself that he was too impatient to worry about all that germ crap. All that germ crap. The outcomes varied tremendously for the survivors of Dr. Freeman's procedure. Some were left in a completely vegetative state, some were left with significant handicaps, and a few, just a few, survived with little deficits, amazingly. It was basically a hit-and-miss procedure at the time, and there wasn't enough knowledge about the brain structure. Dr. Freeman was actually the physician who operated on John F. Kennedy's sister, Rose. He performed an ice pick frontal lobotomy on her at the request of her father due to mild learning difficulties. She was never able to live on her own and floated from facility to facility for the rest of her life, hiding away as the Kennedy family embarrassment. Hashtag justice for Rose. Justice for Rose. Remember, too, that many of these people weren't even admitted for actual mental illness. Back then, you wanted to get rid of your wife or child? Say they're unruly and send them here. People with tuberculosis, epilepsy, alcoholism, and other long-term diseases were also admitted here. Some people spent entire lifetimes in the asylum just to end up in one of the cemeteries in an unmarked lonely grave. Additionally, throughout their time here, it was against the rules for patients to receive visitors, letters, or gifts. They were forgotten, and they knew it. The Charleston Gazette sent a crew in to check out the asylum in 1949 and to do an expose and expose the facility. The crew was completely enamored by what they found. There was no power or heat in the facility, and patients were sleeping on the floor. Due to the completely overworked staff, sanitation had become a low priority and the place described as disgusting and deplorable. They didn't blame the administration or the orderlies for the problems that the facility was facing, though. They blamed the state, stating that it is the fault of the people of the state who refuse to furnish the funds for proper care of our mentally ill, and there can be no valid excuse for the state to subject its unfortunate wards to inhuman indignities. The wallpaper was peeling, and the place smelled of decay. Also, due to overworked and completely outnumbered orderlies, the patients were being locked in cages while the mildly and less worrisome patients were allowed to sleep in overcrowded bedrooms. Patients were dying daily, and the cemetery had to be expanded to an eerie 666 acres in order to make room for the people to be buried. The asylum would notify the next of kin, but most often families would not come to the asylum to identify the bodies or even take them for burial. They would leave their family members to be disposed of by the hospital. Patients who were not claimed by the family were simply assigned a number and buried with a simple stone with the number on it. And over time, the gravestones were moved around and even repurposed, leaving many of them unmarked. It's almost impossible now to identify them all. In the late 1960s, the facility was even graced by the presence of the one and only Charles Manson, who had deed ties to West Virginia after his mother and stepfather were arrested. He was admitted to Trans-Allegheny for a period of time for petty theft and other smaller crimes just before he ventured off to Southern California to build his new family. So let's explore some of the ghost stories. Yeah, there's some paranormal aspects to Trans-Allegheny as well. I tried to get a little more information on some of the ghost stories and really didn't find anything but general descriptions. It seems like the most commonly talked about ghost in Trans-Allegheny is a little girl named Lily who either came with her mother as an infant to the asylum or she was born here. I couldn't really, I heard both stories. When she was around eight or nine, she died of pneumonia in the hospital. So she lived here almost her whole life and never left. That's all she knew. She was raised by the staff and 
Now, a lot of visitors often report her running up behind them and holding their hand. They hear faint sounds of a child giggling in the hallways. People come from all over to leave her gifts and visit her. Wouldn't it be cool to have some accounts like written out from the staff? Yeah, if any staff or former staff of Trans Allegheny want to write to us. Or families of who have any stories from their families who may have worked there or been there. Or That's anyone patient. who has ever admitted. It really wasn't open that long ago. So, maybe we can do a follow-up episode. It's reported that by the 1980s, they had succeeded in decreasing the population a little. The treatment of the patients and the conditions within the facility had not improved, with patients still being locked in cages in the 80s. I also read that they still had patients here that were suffering from the lobotomies that they had received years earlier and could no longer live on their own due to this. The Charleston Gazette stepped in once again with an expose on the facility after a group of court-appointed inspectors were assigned to check the place out. They reported that the asylum was dirty and unkempt, with many patients left naked and confined to dirty wards and bathrooms smeared with feces. The hospital doors were finally closed in 1994 due to the changes in medical practices and standards. Good deal. After the Gazette published another expose, which claimed that patient-on-patient murder was still an issue and being underreported. Also, a man named Brian B. committed suicide in the building and his body wasn't even noticed until eight days after his death. So, over a hundred years of hell were over. Today, the place is abandoned, except for the occasional guided tours that are hosted there and overnight ghost hunts. According to people who have taken these tours, it looks as though everyone just vanished and everything was left as it was. The rooms are full of medical equipment and belongings from past guests. Furniture and wheelchairs that set the mood and give a sliver of an idea of life at Trans-Allegheny over the past 150 years. This is definitely on my ghost hunting bucket list. Absolutely. So we talked about Lily, the ghost Lily, the little Mm -hmm. girl ghost. But there were a couple of other ones also. There's another one called the Creeper. It's commonly reported as a dark entity. It sounds like kind of a shadow creature. Please refer to our Shadow People episode. Yeah, I think it's like the next one. So the creeper is described as a dark shadow entity who crawls along the walls and the floor. You should definitely refer to our Shadow episode. We have a character similar to this. Similar. It's humanoid. They caught it on camera in an episode of Paranormal Lockdown. You can find that on the internet. But a lot of people called out this claim online as a man in a black suit and a lot of camera shadow tricks. I watched the video myself and I really couldn't see it. I really couldn't see the entity at all. So I don't really trust anything recorded for television entertainment purposes. No. To be honest. Not to discredit it if it doesn't deserve it. But So there's another one named Ruth. People find Ruth in the Civil War wing of the hospital. Apparently, during her life, she was very, very, very hard on men. She didn't like them, and she apparently still does not like them. Probably because she was committed to the facility by men. (laughs) Probably. She is known to throw objects at them and makes whistling sounds and pushes them up against the walls. She's said to be pretty scary and violent. This makes me want to visit Trans-Allegheny more. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. I really want to go there. And mostly because I don't trust the TV evidence, you know, I just want to get my own. I want to get to know the creeper myself. Exactly. See what's going on up in there. See some balls of light. There's some balls of light. People have reported. Ghostly figures. They hear screams up and down the hallways. Slamming doors. Moaning. Hysterical laughter. (laughs) And just general breathing. A soldier named Jacob is located on the fourth floor. He's seemingly harmless. He just wanders the halls, but people see him here and there. So, one of these days, we're going to be traveling. We're going to visit Trans-Allegheny. Well, knowing us, we'll be just traveling to Trans-Allegheny. Exactly. We're known to make long road trips for things like this. So we'll make sure and post the videos and any evidence that we collect. This has been this week's episode of Bigfoot for Breakfast. If there happens to be anyone out there listening, we appreciate it. After you hear a few episodes and if you like what you hear, please press the subscribe button on whichever podcast platform you're listening from. And don't forget to drop by iTunes and leave us a review. 
a really nice review. It really, really makes a lot of difference to us. Please don't forget to watch for new episodes every Monday. If you feel compelled, drop by our website, www.bigfootforbreakfast.com, check out episode notes, participate in polls, leave comments on episodes, and so on. Sometimes we'll announce upcoming shows and ask for listener stories to be submitted here to be read on the show, so watch for this as well. Find our Patreon for some other extra added benefits, including videos and Patreon subscriber-only podcast content. Again, we appreciate you listening to us, and we hope you come back next week. Bye! (laughs) She's at it again. Damn Daniels.